So I've been thinking about death even more often than usual these past few weeks. And seeing as I already regularly think about death about three times a day, that's saying something. It might be the fact that I have a friend who calls me several times a week when he has late night heart palpitations that make him afraid to doze off because he might not wake up. It might be because I've been preparing to lead the memorial service for my friend Sherry, seeking wisdom from any sacred text I can find. It might be because I spend the Halloween season watching as many horror movies as I can, with it all culminating in a 12-hour marathon of all seven of the original Nightmare on Elm Street films, Starry Matt. That's what we did all day yesterday. Whatever it is, I decided to spend a lot of time with today's ancient testimony text and basically approached it with a very simple, serious question. Why is Psalm 23 so often used at funerals. The text doesn't necessarily directly address literal death. Even the foreboding locale of the fourth verse, which was once translated as the valley of the shadow of death, has more recently been rendered by our new revised standard version editors as the darkest valley. Now, even if this translation is considered more accurate, it's robbed the verse of some of the poetry that links it to the words of the Old Testament's most famous martyr, one of my favorites, Job, who speaks of the place of no return, the land of gloom and utter darkness where even the light is like darkness. The old poetry of Psalm 23, this valley of the shadow of death, seems to be the phrase that's placed the psalm in the Funeral Scripture Hall of Fame. We can blame this on the Anglicans, who included this psalm in the Book of Common Prayer several hundred years ago and suggested it for funerals, and on the American Episcopalians who reinforced the idea in their edition of the book a couple of centuries later. And ever since, Psalm 23 has held a special place in our mourning hearts, bringing comfort through its pastoral imagery. And it makes sense. Even if the actual text isn't about literal death, its language seems designed to assure readers that dark times have an end and that goodness and mercy and a shepherding hand are always waiting somewhere in the shadows of grief and fear. So, Actually, this text not only seems perfect for funerals, it seems perfect for days like today and tomorrow. All Saints' Day and All Souls' Day, days when those in the Christian tradition remember all of the saints of our lives who have left this earthly plane. The text isn't for those saintly souls who have left. The text is for us, those left behind, the leftovers our lost loved ones actually might not need that comfort anymore. We do. So we gather together, light candles as we'll do in a moment, say names, remember faces and natures, and share space in which we acknowledge that we are all, no matter what, headed toward something. And even if we don't know what comes afterward, we know that death in this world is in the cards for us all. We've seen it happen to those we love, and we know it awaits each of us. We just don't know when and how. But if we read Psalm 23 as a celebration of how we can live on earth, we get assured instructions for how to do so. Look at the text with me. Can we do some scriptural analysis together? Just take a look at the text. Right in the middle, in the second stanza, we've got that bit about the darkest valley fearing no evil and the comforting rod and staff. And around that little center jewel in the middle are mirroring stanzas. Both the first and the final stanza basically break down into trust coming from food, drink, and hospitality. In the first stanza, you've got green pastures giving the food to the sheep, still waters giving the drink, and the trust that God will hospitably lead us in God's right paths. And then, in the final stanza, we've got a mirror image. A prepared table brings the food, an overflowing cup brings the drink, and the trust 
and hospitality comes in the goodness and mercy that will follow us all the days of our lives. Food, drink, hospitality, trust. Sort of like agape at its best. Church at its best. Community at its best. Granted, we are not always at our best, but we'll get to that later. To really delve into this idea of food, drink, hospitality, and trust, we need to give a nod to the mythology surrounding how Halloween and All Saints Day ended up smack dab together next to one another. There's a reason why this weekend is so connected to horror and ghouls and supernatural scares. So way back in the BCs, the Celts filled this time of year with a celebration called Samhain, which translates to end of summer. And like we Christian folk have tended to do for centuries, we reimagined the celebration for very specific reasons. It's pretty widely believed that the Celts celebrated Samhain as a time when the dark of winter set in, when these pastoral people brought their livestock down from the hills into closer pastures and then settled in for the shadowy cold and prayed for the resurrecting power of spring. The Celts believed that this move and the approach of the final harvest was a turning point in the calendar that had not only practical but magical implications. This was a time when the veil between the world of the living and the world of the dead was at its thinnest, and they believed that the dead, at this time especially, could again walk among the living. This wasn't a fearful time for the Celts. They welcomed these spiritual visitors, leaving out extra food and drink to invite them into their homes and earn back their trust. The dead were not strangers, but welcome visitors. So the Christians, on the other hand, had celebrated All Saints Day on May 13th for centuries, but in the 8th century, Pope Gregory III moved the celebration to November 1st. Official church documents give certain reasons, but many scholars believe the calendar move was made in order to line up the Christian holiday with the Celtic holiday, thereby swallowing up the Samhain traditions, leaving them as a beating pagan heart within the Christian tradition. Later, All Souls Day was added so that November 1st and 2nd could cover not just the saintly dead, but all dead. But since the Christians had to deal with the fact that the Celts were so friendly with the wandering supernatural during this time, the church began its practice of characterizing these spirits as ghoulish and frightening, planting the seed for every scarily hungover sexy ghost and sexy bride of Frankenstein that we see wandering around the West Village this weekend. So I think it's a blessing that our November agape meal so often falls during this three-day cobbling together of traditions because our agape meal at its best is a communal light in the darkness. Our building at its best is the same and our ragtag group of regulars at its best is the same. But in order to really keep a consistent idea in my mind and heart of what this light in the darkness really is, I need concrete images that move from theory and aphorisms. I don't know about you. Perhaps you have other ways to get those images, but I prefer placing the poetry of Psalm 23 next to the legend of the ancient Celts laying full tables out for their ghostly visitors. Food, drink, hospitality, trust, even as terror and fear swirls around us. But it's the fact that terror and fear swirl all around our tables that make things complicated. If we could actually stand behind dichotomies that paint clearly saintly and clearly evil portraits of the living and the dead, it would make things a whole lot easier. Life and death feel complicated. Terror and fear feel complicated. The critic James Wood explores this in his study of the magic of novels, how fiction works. You've got to read it if you haven't. He points out that modern novels originally came about as a secular reaction to the venerating, simplified biographies of holy people and Greek writings in which heroes were heroes, villains were villains, good was good, evil was evil. Modern novels began to reflect reality. 
developing into more complex studies of the good and evil warring within individuals, complicating the narrative and appreciating the fact that all of us have potential for both and everything in between within us, especially when you add the social systems in place that promote or dismiss our experiences. So, in a time when terror and fear are felt in unequal measure from person to person, and that's to say all the time, I pray we keep choosing connection over alienation. I pray we keep choosing hospitality and trust because our fears of death come from the same place, but they also come from very different places. And trusting one another doesn't just mean sharing our own stories and opinions, but also listening very deeply to the stories and opinions of one another. Last weekend, the family members of 100 people who have died in encounters with police officers came into New York City to march together. Judson opened its space for these families, those most directly affected by the systemic disconnect between law enforcement and those whom they are called to protect. We let them gather together, away from the crowds, to share memories of their lost loved ones, to create solidarity through storytelling. And we at Judson stood by and listened. I consider this the major work of the church, holding space, offering hospitality and setting a table for connections to be made across terrifying divides. We not only offer a place to talk about the thin veil between life and death, but we offer a place to die unto yourself by listening to the stories of others. A place to listen to fear you've maybe imagined or maybe have never imagined and to nuance the seemingly complicated. We offer a place to not be strangers because stranger things have happened and are happening outside and within these walls. Stranger things are things we can't even imagine but might come closer to imagining if we listen. Because our spirits, both the living and the non-living ones, are holy spirits worthy of knowing one another in our creepiness and weirdness, in our comfortability and terror. Here, we imagine what it might be like if the people of all neighborhoods knew the police officers who have been charged with risking their lives to protect them and what it might be like if those police officers really knew the lives of the individuals who make up that neighborhood. There are systems and history that actively kill such connections. If we knew the lives we were taking, there might be less taking of lives. At Judson, we celebrate the fact that we gladly differ. We say it often. But gladly differing, telling stories, sharing opinions means little unless we are also teaching ourselves to practice listening. This makes us different from any Republican or Democrat debate. This makes us different from any anonymous comments section on a website. This morning, we celebrate All Saints Day, recognizing that pure saints and pure non-saints aren't really real, that death and life aren't always to be feared, but that there are some among us who fear both more than we do and maybe ever will that stranger things have happened and keep happening, and that if even one among us doesn't feel the welcome, if one among us doesn't feel the guiding, shepherding hand of God in the darkness, it is our calling as the church to shine that light, to be that hand, to keep the table filled, the cup overflowing, the hospitality and trust radically offered, and to listen to stranger fears. Listen to stranger terror until we all feel goodness and mercy following and awaiting us around every corner. So, as is our practice at Agape Sunday, we're going to take a moment now to get to know the strangers and non-strangers who are sitting at our table. 
Also take a moment to gather the elements if you're going to participate in communion. You're welcome to participate or not. But get a little bit to drink and a little bit to eat, and we'll share some stories and listen to one another. And then you'll know that it's time to sort of start lighting candles for any of the dead that you would like to light candles for when Dora joins me at the front and starts to lead us in a beautiful song that she's written, We Are One With All. And you are welcome to come up and we will guide you through the candle lighting process if you'd like to partake. Enjoy one another. <laughs> 